Well, thank you, Ashley, for that generous introduction. What a great crowd. Gosh, I'm envious. Um, we never see anything like this in Georgia, uh, or South Carolina, or Alabama, or Tennessee, or Kentucky, or... But North Carolina comes close. They're a pretty big club, but um, this is great. Somebody's doing a lot of good things to make you so large. Um, I'm, I'm going to hasten on because i got so much I want to talk to you about. Um, these three talks that I'm giving today are all sort of integrated into one theme. And I'm glad to be up here talking to you about this because this title, What Bees in Nature Can Teach Us, came to me sort of by way of two epiphanies. Um, the first epiphany actually happened twice. There's two episodes in my life where I got into dairy goats. And um, I enjoyed them both very much, both when I was a young kid growing up in Indiana on a farm and then again in Georgia for a period of time. And, and both times I thought, dairy goats, you know, what can go wrong? You know, you feed one end and you milk the other. And, you know, well, I, I, I like hearing those snickers in the crowd because there's some people who know what I'm talking about. Yeah, there's lots of things that can go wrong. And that little epiphany sort of helped me realize that Anything you go into never gets smaller as you learn more about it, does it? It always gets bigger. The, the horizon is always just out of reach. And, and I have been keeping bees now for 45 years, and I am learning more about them now than I ever have. It truly is a rabbit hole, a deep well from which you can always draw more and more. The second epiphany was, um, happened about 10 years ago. My professional association is the American Bee Research Conference. Uh, many of you have probably attended it. They usually uh, do it in conjunction with one of the national meetings, either the Honey Producers or the Federation on alternate years. And about 10 years ago, I was just sitting there for about my 27th 10-minute presentation, and it dawned on me that I didn't enjoy these meetings anymore. It was a constant litany of viruses, mites, nosema, pesticides, over and over and over again. And it, it came to be as if you wanted to hear about honeybees, the last place in the world you'd ever go to is a bee meeting. And I, I, that's not what I got into it for. I doubt if any of you did either. So about 10 years ago, I thought, you know, I want to go back and just kind of study the bee a little more. And that, that, that decision has kind of shaped my lab and our research and my writing ever since. And so today's lectures will give you a glimpse into the outcome of that sea change that I invoked in my lab about 10 years ago. It seems to me that it's to our benefit to ask this question, how have bees answered their problems in their geologic time? And where in that story can we join them? Where can we link up with the program and not fight it? And all of my lectures today are gonna to be somehow on touching on this theme. And in the process of an exercise like this, we learn that our place is very relative. We're rather small in place and time, that little blue dot is planet Earth, as seen from Saturn, which is impressive, but some of you may remember the, um, the um, oh, my, my advanced, there we go, the um, uh, space probes that went out of Voyagers about 30, 40 years ago now. And um, Carl Sagan, who was a popularizer of science back in the 80s, I'm sure many of you remember him, he personally lobbied NASA that when the Voyager probe was near the orbit of Uranus, he said, we have got to take a picture of Earth because we're just one planet away from leaving the solar system. And NASA did not want to do this, but Carl Sagan in, you know, used, leveraged his celebrity and actually went to the director of NASA and got permission to point the camera back. And you've seen this, the famous little blue dot. Now that little pixel there is us. And yeah, there really is a pixel there in the middle of that circle. But this is just, I think, a healthy exercise to understand that, that in nature we are very relative in place and in time. Now when it comes to time, we know that Earth's about you know, four and a half billion years old, which numbers are hard for me to grasp. So I'm using J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings 
as an intellectual crutch for all of us today. And if you take, it's a big book, by the way, and there is a movie, but the book preceded the movie and is much better than the movie. And I, I think there's many of you out there that probably read this and just kind of go with me there. If you divide the pages and the words in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, you find that honeybees show up the 33rd word from the end, which comes to about 330,000 years ago. Oh, uh-oh, how do I turn that back on? Yeesh. Yeah, can you get the thing back up, please? I'm being some little of a Luddite with this device. I pushed something wrong. Yeah, that little blue arrow. Yeah, great. Okay, well that's the honeybees. What about us? Anatomically modern human beings show up the 14th word from the end about 140,000 years ago. And then behaviorally modern humans only 60,000 years ago. We really are Johnny Come Lately. We are just snuck in at the very last possible sentence of the grand narrative of life on this earth. We are also you know, in the same neighborhood with the honeybees themselves. We are what we call a sympatric species. We were evolving at the same time in the same neighborhood. I'm gonna, gonna talk about that a little bit today. There are, there are consequences to this. The honeybee has influenced us in our biology in the same way we have influenced them in their biology. And I think, I think we humans have an unhealthy habit of, of somehow dissociating ourselves from the natural world when in fact we are in the thick of it. We ourselves are contributing to this natural narrative and the honeybees and the humans have influenced each other in ways that we will talk about. There we go. Okay, what you're seeing here is a diagram that works from the bottom up. And this is a principle that applies generally across the natural order. What you have at the very bottom are loose nucleic acids. And items in biology do not stay as lone little isolated units. They clump together. Clumping is a fundamental pattern that we see over and over in biology. Lone nucleotides get clumped into chromosomes. Chromosomes get clumped into nucleated cells. Chromosome cells then get clumped together into multicellular organisms. And then finally, multicellular organisms get clumped into superorganisms. And this pattern has happened over and over again. This is the pattern of biological organization in the history of life on Earth. And the honeybee, strangely enough, occupies a level higher than we. We are organisms, we are multicellular organisms, and at each one of these stages, the lower levels had to enter into a tacit agreement. They had to say, you know what? I am going to suspend my selfish genetic interests to lump together with other genes and form a chromosome. We are now in this game together. We sink or swim based on our collective fitness. And this has happened over and over. The chromosome said, you know what? We can't really get very far just as a chromosome. Let's bundle together into a cell. And cellulated chromosomes outperform loose, free chromosomes. And the same happened with organisms. We now have the possibility for specialization. But for each one of these steps, there had to be this tacit agreement that we're going to subsume our interests to the interest of the larger group to which we have joined ourselves. And the honeybee demonstrates this. The honeybee colony is analogous to an organism like you and me. And we can make metaphorical comparisons between functions in our bodies and functions in the superorganism. One example will, will help us get the point. What is the brain of the superorganism? Well, the brain of the superorganism is that lateral decision making that the workers do when they're choosing a foraging site or a nest site, the celebrated dance language. This is the brain of the superorganism. The liver of the superorganism is the beeswax combs that catch up the toxins that are out there in nature and just hold them away from the biological fraction of the colony. But the superorganism 
you know, evolved from organisms, and that is solitary bees, as you see in this image right here. Now, what we have in A, B, and C are kind of a simple progression from solitary life to the beginnings of social life. This is the pathway that our honeybee has taken, and the pathway that I'm going to be taking us down today. In the far left, we have a simple, solitary, soil-nesting bee, and this is as easy as it gets. We have one female, she's fertilized, she's dug a single burrow, and she has one little brood ball off there on the left. And on that pollen ball, she lays an egg. That egg hatches, the larva consumes the pollen, and there is no more parental care. And nothing happens for another 51 weeks when the whole cycle starts over again. Well, in B, in the middle, we see something's a little different. We now have two females living together in the same nest. Now there's two possibilities here. They could either be roommates or they could be a mother and a daughter. And there's been a lot of argument in sociobiology about which route did sociality take. And sort of the reigning paradigm now is that daughters tend to stick around with mothers. Now think about this. Nesting is complicated. Nesting is costly. I have to leave the security of the nest I have to mate, I have to dig a nest, I have to provision that nest, and you know, there, that's a lot of steps, that's a lot of energy. Well, what if we just room together? Let's just, just, just room together, and it's, it's, it, it's kind of like this, you know, um, while I'm foraging, you watch the nest, and while you're foraging, I'll watch the nest, and we all benefit. And this has been shown experimentally, it's, a, it's an easy experiment to show that cohabiting females do have a higher rate of brood survival. We call this insurance policy. Because even if I die, there's a good chance that my roommate's secondary parental care toward her larva will help my larva survive. So ultimately, it's been a good winning strategy. Now in C, things have gotten a little more complicated. You count the bees in that nest. We've got one, two, three, four, five females and we only have two brood cells. Someone is not reproducing. And we have here at C that beginning of one of the big hallmarks in sociobiology, and that is division of labor, where some individuals sacrifice reproduction so that others can do all of the reproduction. At least three individuals, we can guess, are not reproducing in that diagram on the far right. What would compel a daughter to do this? Well, it just so happens in the order Hymenoptera, which includes the ants and the wasps and the bees, all of them, the males have only one set of chromosomes. I'm going to be talking about this in more detail later. But what this means for us at this moment is siblings, sisters, do not share 50% of their genes in common like you do with your siblings. I have one sister. She's eight years older than me, and I share exactly 50% of my genes with her. They aren't the same 50% because genes get scrambled up in the formation of eggs and sperm, but on average, I share 50% of my sister Joyce's genes, as you do with your siblings. In the Hymenoptera, they don't share 50% of their genes in common with their sisters. They share 75% of their genes in common with their sisters. And if you want to know why, pull me aside sometime at break and on a napkin and a piece of paper, I can, I can, I can show you the math. It's really quite easy. 75% of my genes in common. So at letter C, what we now have are these sisters who, who, who say, you know what? I could strike out on my own. Pardon me, I'm gonna put this down. My hand's getting tired. I don't like the rock star thing anyway. Uh. There we go. There we go. All right. Ah, my hand feels better. We don't share 75, 50%. We share 75% of my genes in common. And let me think now. It's expensive and costly for me to go out and nest. So I could either go out and nest and raise brood with whom I share 50% of genes in common, or I could stay at home and help mom produce more super sisters with whom I share 75% in genes in common, you know, which one am I going to choose? I mean, this is a no-brainer. I'm going to stick with mom. It's kind of like millennials. 
But this was one of those great moments in evolution. It, when, 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 when the calculus tipped, once they started cohabiting, very quickly there was adaptive benefit to, to forsake that whole nesting thing and just stay at home. Stay at home, help mom make more siblings. And, and this was an enormously successful strategy and it resulted in the types of social insects that we see today. Now, this is a, I hope it's gonna work. There we go. This is the solitary kind of thing. They're doing their solitary gig. Um, you have these patches of semi-bare soil and the females and the males emerge at the same time and they have this, this chaotic activity, a lot of flight, a lot of mating. Uh, some of the males are territorial in their behavior and so you, you get these temporary flushes of action and their phones ring off the hook at the university. It's like, we got these bees in our backyard, what do we spray them with? Um, now actually, that was the conversation we used to have about 10 years ago. Nowadays, it's more like, there's bees in our backyard and I know they're dying and I don't really want to kill them, but I'm allergic and I don't really want them out there, what do I do? Which is an improvement. Okay, this, this is a step in the right direction. So there is hope, you know, the word is getting out there, I think, that the pollinators are in peril, but they tend to cluster together in aggregations like this, which give the false appearance of a social colony, when in fact each one of those burrows is its own little thing. Okay, next step. I have decided to stay at home and live with mom and produce more super sisters. Um, however, I can still lay eggs. And just like worker honeybees, you know what happens when an unmated female lays eggs. They turn into male eggs. They're perfectly viable eggs. Perfectly viable. I'm passing on 50% of my genes, which is not a bad deal. That's the normal. You know, the whole super sister thing is extraordinary. But, you know, if I can, every now and then I'll sneak in one of my male eggs too. Why not? You know, I, I can do that, right? Well, no, you can't. Because along comes the mother and she says, mm, uh, 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 uh. no, no, if you're gonna do this, the rule is only I lay eggs. And those mothers will come around behind and eat their daughter's eggs. And that's what you're seeing here in this image from Francis Ratnicks, who's one of my colleagues at University of Sussex. In the top cell, uh, we have a worker inspecting a worker laid egg. And at the bottom we see a worker removing and eating a worker legged egg. Uh, the mothers do this to their daughters and daughters do it to daughters. Because the idea here is, you know what, if I'm not gonna reproduce, then that means you're not gonna reproduce either. And this is a form we call social policing. Remember one of the earliest points I made was that at each step in the evolutionary scale, there has to be this tacit agreement that the lower levels will cooperate with the higher level. And this is how this is enforced, through individuals eating each other's eggs and only the queen is the one who is free to lay eggs. It's a form of social cohesion and it selects for cohesion of the group. Enter the saxophone music. Yes, we're kind of ramping up here to PG in this presentation. In enough time, we have had a divergence among the females in this lineage and the social history of the honeybee that I'm talking to you about this morning, such that the daughter type lineage gets better and better at doing work, and the mothering lineage gets better and better at laying eggs, until we finally have, for the first time in our history, a divergence between the two, such that, oh, I just blanked out on that side, yeah, that side over there blanked out. Ooh, it's back. Okay, divergent female types. And this is critical in the evolution of not only the social honeybees, but all social insects, including the termites and, um, and the ants and the wasps. Because at this juncture, who is now the unit of selection? Not really the workers, because they're not autonomous. All they can do is work. They cannot produce a new colony on their own. Well, what about the queen? Well, she's not really autonomous either because she is helpless without the work of her daughters. 
So it's at this moment that we have something new show up on the scene, and that is the honeybee superorganism, that highest stratum in biological evolution, where organisms have now pitted their fates with one another in the favor of a larger group. And once this was possible, then the queen, some of the rules were suspended. Prior to this, we had this tidy little monogamous family going on where the mothers were mated to one male and all of her daughters were this super sister situation where they were really related to one another. But now that they're codependent, the queen was now for the first time in evolutionary history free to start practicing multiple mating. Yes, polyandry is the technical word for this. Promiscuity is also used in the biological litter to explain this. And the benefits were immediate. Because in the order Hymenoptera, the ants and wasps and bees, the morphology of the females is very inefficient for retaining sperm. In fact, they lose on average about 97% of it. It's very, very wasteful. Those females that would then practice promiscuity and mate with several males were rewarded with bigger sperm loads and bigger sperm retention, which very quickly selected for much larger colonies. And it's only at this moment of the inception of polyandry that we start seeing the complex colonies that we know in our modern forms today. Colony populations made up of tens of thousands of individuals. In the case of ants and termites, millions of individuals. And it's only once we have large populations like this that more complex things can happen, chief of which we call emergent properties. Okay, emergent properties is a big thing in social biology right now. And it's the recognition that when you take a large group of autonomous individual actors, like this room, like us, if you take enough large numbers of autonomous individuals, their individual decisions that they make based on their own immediate data and their own preferences can add up to emerging order. And I will give you two examples. Two examples that will help you understand this. We used to think, and that based on some papers came out in USDA in the 1910s, that Colonies survived over winter because it's getting cold outside. The cluster shrinks and the bees in the middle are the heat generators. They're the ones who rev their engines. And so this paper in 1910 from USDA, they put these thermocouples in the nest and they measured temperature outside, inside, various levels in the cluster, including the center of the cluster. And they showed that when the ambient temperature went down, the temperature in the core went up. And the conclusion was that the bees on the edge are communicating to the bees in the center, hey, it's getting cold in here, crank up the heat. They respond by shivering their flight muscles, which generates heat, which radiates out and altruistically helps the entire colony. <coughs> Lovely story, but totally false. All you need to have is a bunch of individuals like us, and you will have an overwintering cluster. I promise you that. If this were a giant meat locker, and I were to walk over to the side and turn the temperature down to minus 20, what would we do? We would form a cluster. I promise you, our interpersonal space would dramatically shrink. <laughs> and right, right there in the middle, right there in the middle, there would be, some of them say, um, uh, getting a little warm in here, uh, make way, make way, and they would kind of part until they kind of found their spot in that cluster where they are comfortable. And the combined effect of each one of us finding our comfort zone in the cluster would result in all of us surviving minus 20 degrees with this meat locker turned down. That's an example of an emergent order. Nobody is dictating it from on high. Okay, Bill, I want you to stand right there. Susan, come over here and you stand uh, right there. No, but it's not high hierarchical. It was lateral. And it was just an artifact of each one of us doing our thing. And, and the information scientists and programmers working in artificial intelligence just, just eat this stuff up because the social insects are just full of examples like this. 
I'll give you another one. Look at the space between us. Somebody set up these tables today. I'm probably somebody in this room. I don't know, or maybe the staff of this center. But, but you, you set it up. And look at the space between the back of a chair and the one in front of it. Gosh, it fits a human. We have discovered human space. And I can just imagine them standing out there with their tape measures, right? You know, filling in, oh wait, uh, another couple inches, oh, stop right there, next chair, oh, oh, back a little bit. No, no. Human space was made because it was humans who put out those chairs. You see how silly this sounds? It sounds so kindergarten, it's like, duh, of course. But that is order emerging out of nothing more than it was human-shaped organisms who put out these chairs. And it's not evolution. It's not, it's, it's an, you know, there's more ways for, for novelty to happen in natural history than evolution. And this is one of them. Emergent properties that just bubble to the top once you have a large enough number of actors. And that only happens once we have large colonies which polyandry made possible. Okay, moving on the natural history of our bee, and I think this is important. We have long thought the, the, the canonical literature has always said that the genus Apis evolved in Southeast Asia, and there's many good reasons to think that. Uh, traditionally, we always say that that area of the world where a taxon is most richly represented with the number of species is probably where it evolved. And that's the case in Southeast Asia. We have the largest number of species in the genus Apis in Southeast Asia. Well, a paper came out just recently, 2013, that made a startling conclusion. So you know what? The, the genus Apis did not originate in Southeast Asia. It originated in Central Europe. The oldest fossils that we have of the genus Apis, the true honeybees, are from modern-day Germany and France. And so the latest thinking is that there was two exoduses, if you will, one wave of the genus Apis who migrated into the southeastern Eurasian continent, and that is where we have our modern radiation of the Asiatic bees. Oh yeah, that's kind of cool. Take a look at this. There. That same eastern branch crossed the Bering Strait and, yes, entered North America. This is another paper that came out in 2009. We have our own natural native apis in this continent. All the books that you've read that call apis an old world species, or apis, an old world species, uh, are wrong. We had an apis on this continent, and the authors, uh, Michael Engel of the University of Kansas, he named it elegantly Apis Nearctica. And Apis Nearctica had a long run for its money. It lasted about eight million years before it too uh, went extinct. And this is an actual illustration of what Apis Nearctica looks like. It's from a fossil specimen in Nevada. I know it looks like roadkill, uh, but there really is enough characters there to positively identify it as a member of Apis. A second wave emigrated out of Central Europe down into Africa, and this is the wave of Apis that gave rise to Apis mellifera, our honeybees. And, and modern bee scientists have often puzzled over this distribution. We have, on a modern day map, Apis mellifera overwhelmingly occupying all of Africa, the Middle East, going into Central Asia, and occupying um, Scandinavia. The eastern, Apis serrana, its sister species, has always been excluded to Southeast Asia, and the two ranges never overlapped. And this was a real puzzle until 2013, when this fossil evidence came out of Central Europe, which shows us an important fact, that the mellifera lineage never was in Asia, ever, ever. And this, I think, has important implications for us who worry about varroa mites. Have you ever wondered why out of all of the species of Apis, mellifera and mellifera alone does not have its own Asiatic mite? All the rest of them do. Apis serrana has Varroa jacobsoni, and Nuluensis has their own. There's, there's Euvaroa, which is a different species. There's several species of Asiatic mites, each of which are on the particular Asiatic bee. Why did mellifera dodge the bullet? 
And the answer is answered in this paper from 2013. It was never in Southeast Asia. So when we puzzle over the, the intransience of breeding for resistance to Varroa, we have very good reason because the taxonomic distance between modern mellifera and Varroa destructor are eons apart. Mellifera was never in Varroa territory. Not even its lineage was ever in Varroa territory. So mellifera just simply does not have the genetic tools to deal with an Asiatic mite. Now that's not to say that resistance cannot happen. And we have ample evidences for resistance occurring with people who are selecting for those stocks. But when mellifera demonstrates resistance to Varroa, it's due to some other character totally unrelated to Varroa that is being co-opted for this modern problem. Example, grooming behavior. We know grooming behavior gives resistance to Varroa mites, but it is not a behavior that has anything to do with the mites. That's why they're so bad at it. It has a lot to do with the Braula lice, you know, the bee louse, Braula sica. That is a, not a modern and a natural parasite that lives on our modern honeybees. So the grooming behavior that we have is, is oriented toward the louse, and it does a very good job for that, but it, it's very, very bad at doing any good for the Varroa mite. So this is important for us to understand that the phylogenetic difference between host and pathogen matters. It matters. It matters the speed of selecting for resistance and it also matters even the feasibility at all. And, and this is why Varroa has been such an in, 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 a, a intransient problem for breeders to get uh, resistant bees in mellifera. You know, the biology explains these things. Okay, I want to talk a little bit now about the mellifera. We've talked about the genus Apis. Let's zero in there on the mellifera. This is one of several competing ideas of its radiation out of Africa. Um, probably the most, most credible one, I think. But it envisions two branches of mellifera. And the earliest branch, branch M, uh, left about 30, about 300,000 years ago and moved up into Europe across the isthmus of, uh, the, of Hibernia there with Spain. And this is the M lineage. And if any of you have ever kept or are familiar with the old German black bee, uh, this is where that bee comes from. It's a very ancient out of Africa lineage of, of mellifera. And then, in much more recent times, a scale of tens of thousands of years ago, the C line moved out of Central Africa up into the Middle East and then entered Europe from the East instead of the West. The C line is the lineage that gave rise to modern-day Carnica and modern-day Lagustica. And even though they both ended up in Europe, the M line has been there a whole lot longer than the C line. The C line is a relative newcomer entering Europe about the same time that humans were colonizing Europe from Africa as well. Again, we were commensal. And this gets us to an important point about the ways we have influenced one another. We know that in, in, in human evolution that nutrition was critical to the formation of our brains. And there is nothing that is a bigger nutrient jackpot than a natural bee nest. And ancient humans were well aware of this. And so the jackpot represented by a nest of apis was a huge lottery prize in protein and calories, which was significant for the evolution of our brains. Conversely, their defensive behavior. What is the most dangerous predator in their phylogenetic history? It's us. We are the danger posed to mellifera. And their defensive responses that are so effective to this day are effective for a reason. They are adaptations for us. Heading straight toward the eyes because there's lots of color contrast between our eyes and our skin, our nostrils, heavy contrast of color between the nostrils and our skin. And so they find our orifices really quickly and where they can inflict quickest and harshest pain. The drilling, burrowing behavior, the barbed sting. Why be barbed? 
Why be barbed? Well, it magnifies the defensive uh, effectivity of the colony. Here's what it is. I've got a barbed harpoon with a poison pump attached to end of it. And I'm going to plunge it into your flesh. And now that it's in there, I'm going to pull away from it. Now what am I going to do? I'm going to buzz in your face. I'm going to burrow into your hair. I'm going to drive you crazy while my harpoon is still there doing its job. I have doubled my defensive output. Now multiply that by tens of thousands of members of the nest and you have a very effective deterrent against Homo sapiens. So we have affected one another profoundly and directly and immediately. And it's not without accident that we have this long, deep, visceral connection with Apis mellifera. It is not accidental. It's not entirely a product of culture. It's partly, at least, a product of biology. Cool, huh? Um, the phylogenetic distance thing also works in the opposite direction. If we have a geographic separation between the host and the predator, as we do with the a small hive beetle, then it's very easy for the host to become resistant to it again once they are reintroduced. And we know that mellifera has left Africa only as recently as about 300,000 years ago, which is very brief in geologic time. And then in historic times, that M lineage of bees went up into northern Europe. They got transported in historic times over to the New World. And so that M line temporarily dodged the bullet of the small hive beetle. But the distance is only 300,000 years. You know, it's not millions of years, 14 million years like it is with the Varroa mite. So that's why, to this day, small hive beetles are much easier for our bees to handle. And the very same is true of the tracheal mite, for the very same reason. The geologic time is just minuscule between their separation and their reuniting. Whereas the case of Varroa, there never was a reunion to any connection to have a reunion with. Let's talk about ice ages. They come in important to the bees that we know and love today. Um, Europe got off easy. This is a diagram of the last glacial maximum. And if you took a look at the similar map for North America, it was a whole lot worse. I mean, there was glaciers coming down all, I mean, Canada was entirely covered and all the way down to about central Indiana, Illinois. You know, it was a much further south than this hemisphere of Europe. There's parts of um, southern England and Ireland that didn't even get covered in the last glacial maximum. But by this time, the M and the C lines had both moved up into Europe. And you'll see that there's two particular areas of glaciation that are significant to us right now. Uh, that little snowy area over the Pyrenees Mountains between Spain and France. And then this glacier-covered Alps, which cut Italy off from the rest of the continent. And one of the principles of what we call speciation, when a population diverges into a new species, is when there is a physical obstruction between the two, something like a flood or a landslide, or in this case, glaciers. And with the Carnica branch in Italy cut off from the rest of the sea lineage, it pursued several tens of thousands of years there, reproductively cut off from the continent and that became genetically distinguishable from the neighboring Carnica, which we give it the modern name today. So that Italian peninsula being isolated by glaciers across the Alps is what made possible the unique evolution of Apis mellifera ligustica, which is our beloved Italian honeybee. Now my wife is Spanish, and she interjects her own hypothesis at this point which is, well, they're Mediterranean. Of course they're going to be better. Yeah, so. <laughs> and she may have a point. And I don't think I'm going to get anywhere arguing with her. Um, but I can get a little bit of an argument to her when I look at Spain, because the same thing happened with the Pyrenees, right? We had um, the, that obstruction across the Pyrenees Mountains, which made possible the distinction of Apis mellifera iberica, which is the Spanish bee, from Apis mellifera mellifera, which is the North European bee. The Pyrenees is what made that division possible. Across that wide stretch of real estate from southern Africa to the Scandinavians, the one species, Apis mellifera, in spite of its 20-some different races, which I've named a few of them just now, at the end of the day occupies one of two types of habitats, either a tr tropical type or a temperate type. And the bee that we have is largely a temperate type, even though we all know, especially in this state, 
know, there's been some introgression of tropical types. And if I'm a temperate bee who has, whose, whose mother practices polyandry and we live together as a unit and we're codependent on one another and it's cold over winter and I make a living off of getting protein from pollen and carbohydrate from nectar, then I've got, I've got to deal with winter somehow. And the way I'm going to deal with that is make one heavy investment in a big nest, big population, big food supply and I can only afford to reproduce maybe once a year, maybe twice. And when I do reproduce, I'm going to do it as early as possible in the nectar season to bother future beekeepers. That's not really true, but I'm going to do it as early as possible in the season so that I can survive this great fission event and my, parent, my offspring swarm can survive this great fission event and we can both recover a food supply for winter. It's always winter. Winter is coming. I'm sorry. <laughs> I had to get that in, right? But that's true. That's, that's the temperate modus operandi. And we as beekeepers just kind of plug into that and we exaggerate it, we aggravate it to make the honey crops even bigger. But that is where modern beekeeping comes from, that, that temperate imperatives to survive winter as a contiguous group. The opposite, of course, is the tropical pathway. And in the tropics, things are not quite so urgent because there is a steady stream of nectar. There's pretty much always something blooming. And so there is not so much adaptation to make one big heavy investment in a nest. We can reproduce frequently with much smaller colonies. And that is the life cycle that we see with modern tropical bees, especially Apis mellifera scutellata, the African variety. In temperate zones, what is that available nest site to make a good permanent home? Heavily insulated dead trees or tree bowls um, and with much higher insulative properties coated on the inside with propolis, which is a group adaptation, which has the benefit of waterproofing the nest and has biostatic property or biobacterial static properties as well. What you're seeing here is a bee tree that fell down courtesy of my next door neighbor. And I was able to go there and photograph the propolis sheath on the inside. This is a group adaptation that is healthy for the bees. And we know this from late re recent research. Another thing that's important about hollow trees is their insulation properties, which are much better than three quarter inch standard lumber stock that we use in this country. Uh, this is Jerzy Wojcicki, who's one of my colleagues at the Agricultural University of Warsaw, Poland. And he's demonstrating what's pretty common in Eastern Europe. They use a lot of insulation, including like an insulating pillow uh, between where, the, where our inner cover goes. I think this is a good idea. In Eastern Europe, their entrances also tend to be smaller. I think this is something that bees in nature can teach us, that the insulative properties are something we ought to try to look at. Uh, swarming, we always say that swarming is a bad thing, something that we should avoid if we want large honey crops. And if we are interested in large honey crops, that is true. This is my, uh, one of my hives in my backyard, and my wife again was making fun of me. Since I'm the expert, this is not supposed to happen, but it did happen. But I pointed out to her that they were actually coming back into the nest. Uh, it was a swarm that aborted, apparently, because they all came back. So, so there. I, they weren't really swarming after all. But we know now that swarming is healthy for the colonies. But when they swarm, when they reproduce, that that separates a large fraction of the parasite population. And it resets the pathogen growth curve. Growing, 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 swarm. <laughs> now it's growing, growing, growing. It doesn't eliminate the pathogens, but it resets their growth clock for the better health of the colonies. Should we practice swarm prevention? Well, I do because I'm greedy and I like to make a lot of honey. But from the health of the bees point, it would probably be better if we let them swarm. And this is where I think we need an ag economist to come on board and work up some different business models. What if we were to let a certain fraction of our colony swarm with a benefit to their greater health to offset the relative reduction in honey yield? It may require something like managing more hives, but letting them swarm so that we still retain the same crop size. I don't know, but I think that question is begging to be tested because the biology suggests that swarming is good for their health. This is a diagram showing the stages of um, immunological response to a growing threat. 
in honeybee colonies. And the big message here is the importance of propolis and how it scales down a defensive and an affection response in bees. We know from historic data that we've been managing bees instead of preying upon bees for a period of about 7,000 years. And just as we were the selection pressure for their vicious defense response, we are also a part of the selection toward their gentleness. Defensiveness is a very plastic way to be selected for or against very rapid results. And we have been able to show for 7,000 years that by selecting for gentle bees, we have gotten bees like we know today, ones that we can work without a veil and not necessarily get punished too badly, as my colleague Yves Leconte with the French government is demonstrating here. What does bees in nature tell us about natural densities? Well, for one thing, they don't live in densities like this. Um, we know that when bees are kept together in high densities, that this is selecting for virulence in pathogens. It's like, you know what, I'm a Varroa mite, and I make a living by preying off of my host. And I reproduce in their brood, I kill the brood, which doesn't care, I don't care because I get to reproduce. And as long as there's plenty of other hosts nearby, then I'm gonna reproduce as fast as I can. But if my hosts are fewer and farther between, then it's stupid of me to kill my host. And so low density apiaries, we have shown in some of our work at UGA, and I hope I will have time to show this to you uh, today, we have shown that colonies that are kept in lower density apiaries not only have lower varroa mites and greater health, but they make more honey. And in nature, we see that colonies are kept at about, about a half a kilometer distance. This is one of my master craftsman beekeepers in the Georgia Master Beekeeper Program. She actually got this refereed paper published this past year. She was interested in how can we increase propolis collection. And she tested different ways of roughing up the interiors of hives. One method was using saw kerfs to increase the roughness. And another method was leaving the inside wood unplaned so that it was rough. And she found that any method of, that she used significantly increased it over the smooth interiors. This is another one of those no-brainers. It's like, duh. I mean, we know propolis is good for them, so how can we increase their foraging rate? And Cindy's work, which is published on open access, you can find it if you just search propolis, delaplane, something like that, you'll find it. Cindy's work shown that this can be very easily done with some very simple changes to our building our hive construction practices. A um, little bit on the density thing. We've, this is some of our work. We've been funded the last five years with the National Institutes of Health using honeybees and varroa as a model for pathogen virulence. And we've shown that if you have a low density apiary with a point source infection, that the spread of that infection is comparatively slow because the virulence is less. But in situations like this, where you have a dense and then a dense apiary and then a point source infection, that that spread of the pathogen is significantly faster because it's more virulent. One of my recent PhD students, uh, Brett Nolan, he looked at this when, by replicating three apiaries of different colony densities. He had apiaries in which the hives were touching zero meters apart hives in which they were 10 meters apart and hives in which they were 100 meters apart and then one of the pair he inoculated with 300 varroa mites and keep in mind here he was taking apiary mite averages not colony apiary mite averages and he was able to show a significant decline in mites in those apiaries in which the hives were spaced 100 meters apart now i am not going to go to california or Texas for that matter, and say to all the commercial beekeepers, all right guys, here's the skinny. You gotta keep your hives 100 meters apart. You know, yeah, right, this ain't gonna happen. But I can ask a group like this and say, knowing this principle, what can you do to modify your management to keep your hives in lower density apiaries? Another study that just, in fact, our most recent paper, it just came out last month. You know, once again, you can search for Delaplane, density, varroa, and you'll find it. And this paper that came out last month showed that apiaries that were kept in low density situations um, actually produced more honey. Another one of our models showed this. What do you do when you have a dead out in a yard? There's the dead one there on the left. Well, I know, let's take it out and let's uh, replace it with another one, right? Wrong. 
Uh, we have some modeling work that we've done that has shown that if you have bees and mites in an apiary, that there is surprisingly rapid evolution of genetic differences between those populations compared to an adjacent apiary. So if you are practicing any kind of selection for resistance in your mites, then you can expect that reaction at an apiary scale. So if you've got resistance happening in this apiary and you get a dead out and you bring in an alien from outside and plunk it in, you've just, you've just diluted whatever selection you've been managed, able to achieve. And blow, this, this just blows me away, but it's actually published. It was one of the papers I just showed you there. We can have genetic differences within the scale of a season. And I'm, I'm frankly shocked by that. I was a cynic. I did not expect that result. But you can get identifiable genetic differences within the scale of a season from selection processes that you are practicing as a beekeeper. So keep, if you can, the integrity of your breeding program by selecting within an apiary for your, your dead outs. Yeah, here's that paper I was talking about, low density uh, versus high density. This is a high density, visually simple apiary, which they were set up in a row. They were kept plain on the front with no symbols to encourage bees to get confused. And then at other apiaries, the hives were spaced 10 meters apart and kept in a circle with symbols on the front to reduce drift and spread of mites. And these graphs are showing you the blue lines are those low density apiaries in every situation had more honey. More honey, what's there to not like? Healthier bees, more honey in low density apiaries. This is a principle that we have shown in at least three different ways now in the last five years and many other labs have been showing the same kind of thing. So this is a real a, a reality here. Okay, I think I'm encroaching on time. I apologize for that, but let me try to recap some of the main points that I'll be talking about here and then later on in my lectures. If any of this interests you, I'm going to be drilling into some more specific aspects of this. Uh, particularly breeding that I think you'll be interested in. Uh, bees in nature tell us our place in time. We are deep in time and place. Uh, cooperation and sociality are the way nature makes organisms. And very oftentimes evolution gets sort of a, a polemic against it that is survival of the fittest, selfishness. But the flip side of that coin is equally true that cooperation has been at least as successful as competition in natural history. And that story didn't get told enough. Uh, right, I'm having trouble reading. The superorganism re you know, requires this subsummation at each level. If you're interested in how this can go bad, I have a lecture this afternoon entitled Mutiny, which I think you'll find interesting. It's not all paradise inside a beehive. And there's at least two things that are very practical for beekeepers coming out of that lecture. The evolution of superorganisms mirrors the evolution of organisms like you and me. Cooperation is a winning strategy in natural history at all levels. Bees and humans are sympatric. Our relationship to them is deep and visceral for biological reasons as well as cultural. And Apis mellifera and Homo sapiens are pan-global. And finally, agricultural practices in which we try to insert honeybees is pretty much diametrically opposite to their biology. I'm sorry that was fast. Um, but there's a lot more to this that I could speak on for days. So catch a little bit of that if you want this afternoon. Again, thank you for having me here.